Good day and uh, welcome to this week's message. And uh, I should actually say thank you for welcoming me into your places, wherever that may be, uh, nearby where I live or further away or maybe, who knows, around the world somewhere. All I know is I'm very uh, grateful for you to have me in your places. And uh, we want to continue uh, in this sermon series that we have been putting together here week after week as we go through 1 Peter uh, verse by verse or uh, text by text, section by section, however you want to view it or understand it. And uh, we're calling this sermon series A Living Hope. A Living Hope. So with that in mind, uh, it's a, a little bit of a historical, uh, historical uh, research, if you will. And we want to consider, as we begin, the, uh, the later years of the Roman Republic, which is also known uh, in uh, history as the classical age of the Roman civilization. All this was prior, of course, to the Roman Empire. And in that classical age, towards the end of it, uh, history records a series of three slave revolts. These have been called the Servile Wars. The Servile War. Serviles from the Latin word meaning slave. Slave Wars. And the, and the first Servile War was from 135 BC to 132 BC. And this was a slave rebellion on the island of Sicily. And this was sparked by ill treatment of plantation slaves uh, by their owners. And history records that they had initial successes against the Romans, uh, the Romans and their forces, and this resulted in the slave army capturing the majority of Sicily. However, the success would eventually be turned around and they would be defeated by 132 BC. And the slave army, defeated, would also be tortured and killed by the Roman armies. And it's recorded that at least 20,000 of these slaves were crucified. We go 28 years later to the year 104 BC, and for the second time on Sicily, slaves again succeeded by rebelling against the Roman Republic for ill treatment by some of the owners. Yet once more, by 101 BC this time, the rebellion was defeated by the Roman armies. Again, many of the slaves tortured and killed or sent to the arenas in Rome for public entertainment. And again, history records that these slaves refused to fight in those arenas and they would kill each other instead. We go back, we fast forward again another 28 years, approximately to the year 73 BC and the third servile war, which has also been called the Gladiator War. And this particular slave rebellion uh, began when around 70 slaves or so, slave gladiators escaped from the gladiator school located on the Italian mainland just north of Naples. And they easily defeated the small Roman force sent to capture them and the slave gladiators and their army would grow within two years to a force of approximately 120,000 men, women, and children. And this army would be roaming across Italy, the landscape, raiding estates, and defeating pretty well every Roman force sent their way. And they were led by effective leaders, courageous leaders apparently, or effective leaders anyways, including the slave gladiator that we all might be familiar with from the movies, Spartacus. By 71 BC, Rome eventually sent an army of eight legions, which, uh, depending on how you read and where you read it, this could be around 38,000 infantry and assorted cavalry, and they decimated the slave army, the gladiator slave army. And the survivors, recorded to be around 6,000 strong, were crucified along the ancient Appian Way which runs from Rome, Rome all the way to south east, southeast Italy for approximately 350 miles. We again go further ahead in history to the time of the Apostle Paul 
Around 62 AD, he wrote writing a letter to Colossae, the Christians in Colossae, and he said this, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. That's from Ephesians chapter 6. Did I say Colossae? I meant Colossae. So I'm not quite sure what that is. I'll, I'll put that in the, in, the, um, in the description somewhere. I got Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 to 8, which is probably incorrect. Anyways, uh, we want to now turn to 1 Peter. I got this one right. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 to 25. And, we, and let's do that. Let's read that together. Chapter um, 2, verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Dear Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that abides in each and every believer. And we ask, O Holy Spirit, of living God, that you would teach us and lead us and inform us and change us and shape us to become more and more like Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We pray this for your glory, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, I... Uh, Remember now, uh, that text I read to you before we read it in 1 Peter is actually from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 to 8. And he was writing to the church in Ephesus, not Colossae, around somewhere between 60 and 63 AD. Uh, we don't have time to look at that any closer, but I just wanted to correct myself. Back to our uh, particular text here in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, if you uh, watched or were with me last week, if you're watching this and you were with me last week, uh, we had transitioned in our study from the Apostle Peter's formal theological exhortations uh, in chapter 1 leading up to chapter 2, assuring and encouraging his audience in that time, facing a variety of trials for their faith and trust in Christ. Peter had reminded the elect exiles, that's what he calls them in chapter 1, of their promised inheritance, awaiting uh, them, this inheritance that's imperishable and waiting for them. This was the living hope that he was pointing them to. It was a hope born out of a spiritual transformation by the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, which he obviously alludes to in chapter 1 as well in verse 2 and an actual historical event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's verse 3, chapter 1. My friends, the believers have become, as Peter said here in chapter 2, we looked at this recently as well, he, he called them a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We might want to ask, whose possession? Well, in verse 10, the following verse, he said, once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. These elect exiles are God's people as all believers are to this day. 
And you might remember earlier in his letter again, the Apostle Peter had said to the elect exiles, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. That's in chapter 1, verse 14. He said, don't know, don't be like that, but be like God who said this, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Again, that's in chapter 1, verse 16. There, Peter quoting Leviticus, four, uh, Levi, pardon me, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. Well, back in chapter 2, Peter then would repeat his exhortation regarding a believer's conduct, reminding them in chapter 2, 11 and 12, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your souls. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. And this, all this kind of exhortation ends here at chapter 2, verse 12. And there Peter transitioned beginning here at verse 13 in chapter 2 and up to and including chapter 3, verse 7, where Peter provided his audience uh, with a standard, if you will, or a code, specifically when we look today in the slaves and masters and then the wives and husbands, a household code for the believer's engagement in their particular cultural context. And this was the question that we were faced with last week. We asked last week, are you and I as citizens of God's kingdom and as resident aliens or citizens of this world, good citizens? We already stated last week that it is very evident, even in our time, that those who proclaim, there are some who proclaim themselves Christians that are not good citizens by the evidence of their actions. And there are non-Christians, unbelievers, however you want to call them, that are good citizens as revealed by their actions. But the Apostle Peter had urged his audience here in verse 13, we looked at this last week, to be subject to, in other words, to be subordinate, to be under uh, every human institution. The NIV puts it every human authority, verse 13. And this was for the Lord's sake, according to Peter. Whereas Apostle Paul said in his letter, to the Romans, chapter 13, verse 1, Paul said, let everyone be subject, same sort of word here, same verb, to be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Maybe running through your mind right now is a question. Maybe it's just a question I want to pose to you. You might be saying, Pastor, you, might, you mean even if the authority is a tyranny? And I would answer yes. We see him talking about this kind of situation. Uh, here, Peter's talking about it in his context, where he said in verse 14, whether it be to the emperor or as supreme or to governors as sent by him. Not every emperor slash king, not every governor sent by the emperor slash king or their associates, the civic and local authorities, were good people. And some of them were outright tyrannical, as they are in our context today in the world around us. But he, the Apostle Peter does define for the elect exiles and for you and me the limits of the governing authorities that Paul used, or the human institutions, the human authority that Peter uses here. They have limits to their responsibilities that God has given to them, that God has established. And what are those limits? It tells us in verse 14, chapter 2, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. And then the apostle Peter then summarized the good works and the conduct of believers when he said to them, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor, verse 17. But I do want to deal with what I'm calling an elephant in a room. Want to run around stomping on people's toes. Let's keep this simple and as objective as possible. Yes, the, the Bible teaches us and the, and the scriptures teach us, the New Testament writers teach us that we are to respect the authorities God has instituted, put in place in a fallen world to punish those who do evil and to honor those who do good. But friends, when the governing authorities promote immoral and evil philosophies, ideologies, laws, and legislation, and anything else that is contrary to the commands of God in the word of God, 
believers obey God over the authorities. We have an example of this from the, uh, the book of Acts. Um, in the early church, just after Pentecost, as the church was growing and becoming fruitful and effective in Jerusalem, the Pharisees were getting quite concerned. We find this in Acts chapter 5, where Peter and the apostles were arrested. And then upon, before they were released, they were told they must not speak of Jesus and his message. In other words, they must not preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And Peter said to these uh, ruling council of the Jewish authorities of the day, he said to them, we must obey God rather than men. If you remember what Jesus said to the apostles before he ascended into heaven, he said, go therefore and make uh, uh, disciples of all and every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'll be with you to the very end of the age. This event here is recorded for us in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, is where Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. Well, as we contemplate all that has been uh, said so far, we find our place now at verse 18. And why don't we read verse 18 and 19 together to remind ourselves of what it says, verse 18 and 19, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Now, there's a few things that should be said uh, before we focus here on Peter's uh, statements. And the first point I want to pass on is we need to keep in mind that while Peter in these verses address a first century cultural reality, social reality, he did not abandon the overarching theme of his letter that believers suffer, the believers were suffering for their faith and trust in Christ. Those were his audience, believers suffering for their faith and trust in Christ. Friends, you know, as we think about our own context and some of the things that maybe you may have heard or seen by teachers and preachers and Bible studies and whatever over the time that you've followed Christ, we know for sure that following Christ does not come with a prescription for rose-colored glasses. That would not be reality. Second point, suffering, trials, and persecution for one's trust in Christ can be experienced from just about anywhere and any place. From friends, from our families, from employers, and even from governing authorities to mention a few potential sources. And last but not least, Peter was stating that the believer must remember that their identity is the people of God and by example of Jesus Christ to submit to every authority instituted by God. Now let's go back to our text. And we have to consider this as well. Verse 18 to 20, as we read that, maybe, and I have no doubt, in some cases, our 21st century sensibilities have been agitated, have been challenged. Maybe some of you, when you read these kinds of verses in the Bible that address masters and slaves, the abuses of slavery on various people groups of our recent history over the last few hundred years might come to mind. And as we consider, consider Peter's first century context, we will not toss aside the wrongness of slavery. However, we will need to set aside our cultural preconception, presuppositions, for a moment as we address these moral and ethical issues the first century Christians were facing. Friends, for the sake of time, we will keep to the context which our verses are located, and specifically in respect to what Peter said here in verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect. Here we have the Greek uh, noun translated by the ESV, which I'm using, uh, translated servants. It's translated by Greek scholar William Mounts as household servants. And the NIV, if you use an NIV, it uses the word slaves. So the question is, what does it mean? Does it mean slaves? Does it mean servants? Does it mean household servants? It's interesting to note that Peter did not use the primary word used for slaves in the New Testament Instead, he uses a word that can mean a member of a household. And this Greek noun is also used to refer to a house slave or a domestic or a slave. But here's a rule of 
Bible study to understand how Peter was using it. Now we look at the context that it is found in, which dictates the meaning. And the context is verse 18 to 20, which we just read, and also verse 21, which we can read now together. Verse 21, for this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. And we also look at the historical context that this letter was written into the time and realities of the first century, such as the Roman Empire. And in the first century Roman Empire, the majority of domestic services in a home or in businesses, but specifically in households, were primarily done by household slaves. I think Mounts has really done it right by calling them household servants. So, and that, and for that reason alone, we need to talk briefly about first century slaves. Again, our 21st century um, sensibilities and our 21st century understanding of slavery uh, might get in the way. Because here's a fact. By the time of the writing of Peter's letter, slavery played a very important part in the Roman, uh, in the Roman Empire. It was economic reasons, it was cultural reasons, it was social reasons. What began with Roman battle uh, victories where prisoners would become slaves had grown by the first century, according to history, to about 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. And not only we have to remember, or at least we have to know, acknowledge, that they did not only do the uh, menial tasks, these slaves in the first century, but there were doctors, they were teachers, they were musicians, they were secretaries, they were stewards, they were actors, and so forth and on. Another fact, all the work of Rome was done by slaves. As one commentator put it, quote, for a Romans, from a Roman's point of view, no point in being, it was no point in being master of the world and doing one's own work. We turn to theologian and biblical scholar Craig Creener and his contribution to the New Testament IVP Bible background commentary. And there he points out that many household slaves, which Peter addressed here in our text, were able to save if they were able to save enough money, would be able to buy their freedom. And we also understand and learn that some would stay on with the family as free household servants working for these homes, these Romans. It seems that in many Roman households, slaves and masters cooperated as member of a, members of a common family. Because one of the key uh, values, ethical values of the first century was social order. That would be one good reason for this to happen. However, as much as the Roman foundation of slavery was different than slavery, for example, in North America from the 17th century to the 19th century, uh, Keener reminds us in his commentary that under Roman law, slaves were viewed as property. And it was not uncommon for some masters to treat their slaves badly and even abusively. And the majority understanding in the Roman culture was that slaves were socially inferior. So it is in this kind of social, economic, moral, and ethical context that Peter said, household servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Verse 15, 18. Well, if you've been tracking with us so far, same with the church body. Uh, by now, we should have a good grasp on how Peter means his readers to understand the verb be subject. So we will move on to the Greek noun that we find in this text, translated by the ESV with all respect. And to get at the meaning, we don't have to look too far than the New King James Version or the NIV. Both tr translations help bring clarity for us. The New King the New King James Version translates the Greek noun with all fear, the NIV in reverent fear of God. We want to go back to the Apostle Paul's comments on submission to authorities in his letter to Rome uh, in chapter 13, Romans 13. There he would summarize this teaching by saying this, that the Roman believers were to pay respect to whom respect is owed and honor to whom 
whom honor is owed. Romans 13, 7. Paul using the same noun that Peter does in his letter here, meaning reverential fear or respect. Well, folks, let's press pause for a moment. Clearly, we can see from the text and from the historical context that Peter was addressing first century believers who were household slaves or slaves. And we know that slaves were considered nothing more than property according to Roman law. And it would not be too much of a stretch and rather reasonable to presume that Christian slaves living in a polytheistic uh, household, that is a, a household that uh, uh, worshipped many different gods, would be open to the very least skepticism or at the worst a variety of abuses from their masters. Now you might be saying to yourself, what's all this got to do with us today in our context? After all, we don't have slavery today. Now, if that's what you're thinking, first of all, let me just wake you up a little bit. Yes, we have slavery in our day. For example, globally, estimates of modern slavery, there's about 28 million in forced labor, as I am speaking. And as tragic as that is, that's not the issue here in Peter's letter. As Christians, we are to submit to the authorities over us in our vocations, our jobs. And of course, Peter was addressing here in this letter of his the extreme kind of employee and employer relationship, master and slave. But we need to ask this question. What is Peter's primary point? Is it not that believer, as believers we ought to submit to those who have authority over us in our vocations, in our jobs? That we are to give respect and that we will receive respect in kind. Maybe not all the time, but it usually means that. Of course, if those in authority over us, as we consider uh, our vocations, our jobs, tell us to do something that God forbids, we don't do that. We do not do that. And it doesn't have to be complicated. For example, we don't steal from our employer and we don't join a supervisor who is encouraging us in his, their, his or her position to steal or cheat. And then we'd share in the, in the uh, monetary uh, value that comes out of that. And of course, if the supervisor abuses his position, we don't close our eyes and allow it to continue. We do something about it. And yes, at the risk of losing our jobs. Peter reminded his audience here in verse 19 and 20 that this is a gracious thing when mindful of God one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. When believers do good and suffer for it, endure their suffering, this is commendable before God. Verse 20, that's how the NIV puts it. So what are we to do with the submission to governing authorities and masters that Peter was addressing here in his letter? We are to emulate Christ. We just read this in verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you as an example so that you might follow in his steps. We live in a fallen world, in a world that is not run uh, in a holy and right ways in every place and space. And Christian, true believers, followers of Christ, will be opposed for their holiness, their desire to be holy as God is holy. We are representatives, if you will, ambassadors on this earth of the kingdom that we are citizens of. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So what are we to do with the submission then that Peter was addressing here in his letter? How is this applicable to you and me as believers in the 21st century context. First, we have to decide something. We have to decide who we will serve. Friends, everybody serves somebody. Some serve others, and some serve themselves. 
And according to Peter and the biblical context of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, uh, the latter is not a good and right choice for you and me if we call ourselves Christians. My friends, the Church of Jesus Christ does not bury its head in the sand and disengage from the culture. Jesus didn't die on the cross for you and me to circle our wagons and hope for the best. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount that's recorded for us in Matthew 5, he said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on, but on a stand that gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. Apostle Paul, in his letter to his fellow core worker Titus, gives us the way to accomplish what Jesus said in Matthew's gospel. Paul said to Titus, Be submissive to rulers and authorities. Be obedient. Be ready for every good work. Speak evil of no one. Avoid quarreling. Be gentle. Show perfect courtesy to all people. Be careful to devote yourselves to good works. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 to 11. We can summarize Peter and Paul's exhortations with four words. Give respect. Get respect. Four words. Give respect. Get respect. Let us pray. Dear friend, dear Lord, we thank you. Thank you for my friends. I don't know what's going on in their world. I don't even know who they are. I, I can't see them. But you know them, you created them, you molded them and shaped them into their mother's womb, according to Psalm 139. Lord, you know every single hair on their head, you know exactly everything about them. Whether they're going through something awful and terrible, whether they're on the mountaintop full of joy and everywhere in between. So Lord, I pray that we would understand what this text means. It means that we are to be citizens of the kingdom of God on this earth. We're not to be taken away and hidden somewhere. We're to be engaged. We're to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ who has come to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And we're to take what comes our way and endure it for the cause of Christ. We cannot do that on our own, dear Lord. We need you. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to study our word. We need to pray. We need to be in fellowship with each other. We need to encourage each other. We need to be honest with each other. We need to confess to one another. We need to be the body of Christ. We need to be a hospital where people can come in out of the dark and terrible places that they struggle with and find hope, a living hope, a change. Oh, Father, a place to be granted repentance unto salvation. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.